Welcome to Coffee with our researchers. This uh, series has been a hit, I have to say, and we're now on to episode six. I'm Galit Solomon, the Director of Marketing and Communications with Canadian Associates of Ben Gurion University. We're also known as CAVGU. And uh, for those of you who've been following us, Coffee with Our Researchers is a monthly 30-minute segment in which one of our staff members sits down with uh, BGU researchers for a casual conversation over coffee or tea to learn about a hot topic coming out of the university. And today, I am pleased to introduce Simon Ben-Simon, our Executive Director from Montreal and Ottawa, and he will introduce today's topic. Simon, the screen is yours. Thank you, Galit, and hello, everyone. Today, our guest is uh, Professor David M. Brock, a professor at the Guilford Gla Glazer Faculty of Business and Management at Ben Gurion University. He is a graduate of the University of South Africa, the University of Cape Town, and North Carolina State University. Prior to moving to Israel in 2002, David lived in Auckland, New Zealand, where working at the University of Auckland Business School. And before that, he studied and taught at North Carolina State University. He is uh, founding editor-in-chief of Journal of Professions and Organization, and currently serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of International Management and the Journal of Management Studies. So good morning, good afternoon, David. Welcome. Uh, you're quite familiar with Canada and with Montreal, having been with the, uh, the Ben Gurion team that participates in the John Molson School of Business MBA case competition. And if we have time, maybe we'll speak a little bit about uh, yeah. that experience. But uh, as my first question, so from you, your CV, you have an undergraduate degree from the University of South Africa, an MBA from the University of Cape Town, a PhD from North Carolina State. You taught in New Zealand, the United States, and now Israel. How could you describe the teaching of business management in each and how they differ? Well, okay. First, before I start, welcome from the beautiful campus uh, of Ben Gurion University uh, here, um, here in Beersheba. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. I'm sitting in my office. The Soroka off, uh, Hospital is to my left here. The, the uh, library to, to my right. So uh, I feel very fortunate to be here. And uh, as Simon described, it was a long uh, route for me to get here via South Africa, the United States, New Zealand, and all sorts of other, other places where I've taught. I also, uh, in addition to that list, I also taught a course uh, in China. So um, I guess, um, you know, in academia, there, there are very much standard ways that courses are taught. So if you ask the same question to someone in math or in, you know, in, in psychology or, or physics, you'd probably get a similar kind of answer that we have, you know, we all kind of learn from the same models. And, you know, physics 101 is taught very similar wherever you, wherever you are. And, and, and I think in business schools, we even more... Um, you know, um, standardize the way we teach things because because it's a younger disciplines. We haven't had you know the you know thousands of years to evolve. Um, so um, so I think you know if you kind of just go for a random place uh, and got got went to the university, be it in Europe or North America or South America, and went into a marketing class or a strategy class, you 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 probably hear some of the some of the things. You may even study the same cases. You know, we used to joke about the Timex case. <laughs> which was written in the 1950s, classic uh, organizational change. But, so there are, a lot of, there are a lot of similarities. Uh, when we talk about the differences, there's, there's, also, there's also there's very much generational differences which change over time. So I think there's was, you know, um, more uh, in common, you know, um, you, know, in, in, you know, in the earlier years of, of business schools. And, and now what you have is the, you know, where they call it Generation X or Generation whatever they call themselves that are less uh, likely to read that 40 page case that I want them to read on Timex or some old story that I think is really important. Um, right. You know, and in the old days they would say, yes, professor, they, you, know, they, you know, how soon do we have to read it? And today they're more likely to say, uh, you, know, <laughs> um, you know, tell me why it's important. 
Um, right. So that, that that's you know thing, things have changed more across and, and that, across, across uh, the world, and you're more likely to find those sort of similarities today, whether you're teaching a, the same course in China or or in Israel or in or in Montreal. Um, so um, yeah, um, I think uh, yeah. So yeah, there are more similarities, more similarities than, than differences. And again, here in Israel, where we um, Again, uh, you know, uh, I think very much more than other places realize that, that time is money, and um, you know uh, we have to we have to uh, be aware of the fact that our students often are part time students, and we have to be aware of you know how much reading material we give them, so we, they're more likely to want active learning and um, and hands on on exercises. Than, than you know, reading lots of cases and reading chapters from old textbooks and that sort of thing. So, so, uh, let, yeah, let, so let's dive a little bit in terms of the Israeli model or the Israeli psyche, the Israeli uh, way of doing things. You know, the the startup nation phenomenon. The uh, and then you you match the startup nation with the do it yourself generation, where you can create the entrepreneurship spirit uh, that is uh, amongst young people around the world and in Israel, uh, obviously the, the military experience, where does, the, where does a business school, an Israeli business school fit in all these things? And how does it convince students that yes, a business degree is valuable. You don't, you just don't go from uh, zero to 100 in uh, without the proper steps. Right, so that's a very good question. and. It's a question that we've had to ask ourselves. I think a generation ago, we didn't have to ask that question because business schools were considered elite and students considered themselves fortunate to be admitted here. But now we do have to ask that, that question. And the, the way we answer that question is, is, is to make things relevant to students. And um, I think to break out of the traditional silos that universities Used to be, and you know, so we used to have a, you know, the physics department and engineering and the business school and psychology, very much uh, uh, separate today. In, uh, in 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 the startup nation, we realize that we have to we have to work together, work together. I have to learn from the guy in in engineering and and the person in, um, you know, in, in in physics and philosophy and the medical school, and um, so there's a lot more cross pollination of ideas. And it's 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 been good for us. It's, it's it forces us as academics as to to bring relevant learning, bring relevant material, bring active learning and active material to to our students, uh, get us out of our silos, and um, and and then you know make sure that the, that the students um, are getting. Um, a feeling of satisfaction that they're learning something that's helping them that they're going to be take back to the office, be it you know after class or tomorrow, and 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 make them better uh, managers or better whatever they're supposed to be in 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 their workplace. That's interesting because uh, as I mentioned in in the, my introduction, you you had an experience with uh, coaching the um, BGU team at the uh, John Wilson School of Business, Concordia University International MBA case competition, and uh, which is a very uh, high powered uh, MBA case competition. But more recently, Concordia University launched a joint uh, engineering and commerce case competition where the teams are made up of engineering students and business students, and they come together for the first time and uh, and compete and uh, BGU has also sent teams and it was interesting the process where there's these engineering students had never met business students many of them and vice versa many of them have not had not taken courses in the others faculty and coming together was is very interesting are you is, are more things along those lines happening at the university Right, um, very much so. Um, you know, um, and you come to campus every now and then. We have Yazamut uh, 360, yes. um, which is you know that's the whole point. You know, is that we're you know we're 
get us out of our faculties, out of our silos, and get us talking about a project which may involve, you know, cybersecurity, or it might involve a, a medicine, or it might involve, a, a, you know, um, it's, you know, some some uh, automobile, or, or um, and so then we have the marketing, the finance, and the goodness knows whatever comes from the, from the other faculties. So it's it's been it's been a game changer. And um, you know, for for the old generation like me, it's been it's it's you know it's been a, it's been, a, it's been a, a steep learning curve. I think the younger guys, they were they were more used to it, and they they were you know more it was closer to their um, to their roots, especially the, the, the Israeli guys. Of course, I'm uh, an Ole, so a lot a lot a lot of you know Israeli uh, thinking is is new to me, but. But it's been very good for me to have to, to have to you know, see how things are done here, and then to bring my students into 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 the uh, thought processes that, that are relevant and helpful uh, for competing in this world. So, so it's it's really wonderful, and it's it's been for the for the better for 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 academia and business schools in general. I'm sure it keeps things uh, challenging as well. Get to sudden mischief, yes. <laughs> Gives you right. So uh, just looking at your areas of specialty, I see you specialize in international ma management and professional services. So can we split those two up and uh, give us a little bit more information about each? All right, so international management, um, think about what management is getting things done, uh, any project. Uh, any you know managing a business, managing an organization, managing a nonprofit, you know, uh, managing a university. Um, so we, I guess you would might, you might start off thinking of that that um, unit you're managing, that organization might be in a single country in Canada or in Israel. Uh, so international says, well, you know, no, we're 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 in the in the open world. And it could well be that you know um, we are are uh, we raising funds from you know and uh, stocks and debt from you know, different stock exchanges around the world. Our products come from various countries, international supply chain, and our people, uh, very importantly. And this is very much the Israeli and also somewhat the Canadian uh, um, experience. That our people are very fluid. They're crossing uh, international borders all the time, speaking different languages. Bringing different cultures, and it's a challenge sometimes having to manage people who speak languages that we don't speak, right. have cultures that we don't speak, have religions that we're not so familiar with. So the management of of, of expatriates, for instance, is something that, that I've written about and we we, we teach about um, in Israel. They call it relocation, and it's it's so common in Israel. You know, they you know whether they go for three months or three years or um, you know, longer or shorter Israeli companies and Israeli organizations and international organizations, you know, use Israelis overseas. So, the, you know, the, the, the flows of people and other resources, you know, finance, products, raw materials across international borders uh, um, differentiates uh, this field of international management. And then we also have international strategy, which is decisions about whether to customize or how to customize products um, uh, across across borders. You know, for instance, there's some kind of thing about electronics, for instance, which is generally not customized, but yet, you know, Nestle, when it's you know selling and designing coffees and baby soup, baby foods and ice creams, um, it needs to be aware of different national tastes. So those yeah. sorts of decisions. Um, are all come under the international management uh, 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 header. But that, that's probably the most complex area of management. Uh, there's even within countries, uh, you have cultural differences, linguistic differences. In Canada, for example, I, rem I remember Pepsi launched a, a campaign that was great in English Canada and totally bombed in French Canada because they just adapted the English cultural to Quebec and it was a, a total failure. So that's right. where does where do Israelis again, Israelis that have a very strong culture, um, a unique language, a unique religion, is there where does culture shock come in to into all this? 
Well, by the way, um, just as uh, as Canada is diverse, and you may say that the little country to the south of you with the 50 states is somewhat diverse, uh, this tiny little country in the Middle East of only 8 billion people is incredibly diverse. Uh, right. If you look at the Israeli soccer team, uh, you know, it looks like the United Nations, uh, where right. just, just judging by the external features uh, of the people <laughs> and the names of the people and the religions of the, right. of the people. Uh, just remarkable. And, and I'm not talking about it's, it's not a, you know, a situation where they are um, overseas, but they're all Israeli citizens, right. everyone, right. everyone of those right. 11 or whatever. And so right. we're a very diverse country. And, and of course, the old Sephardi, Ashkenazi, uh, you know, Arab, within the Arab, we have the Christians and the Muslims, and even with that, yeah. you know, yeah. complexity, yeah. the Jews, um, very, very complex with, 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 within, within, within Israel. Um, so, um, yeah, so culture. We have national culture, we have organizational culture, we have with, we have culture across country, uh, across countries, between countries, and with, within countries. Um, uh, usually, uh, you know, the, the usually though, when you think about a you know a marketing campaign or a, a management system, uh, they are not uh, um, that sensitive to within the national uh, cultures, which is why you have that, you know, in Israel we say fashla, uh, how do you translate that uh, um, embarrassing era, that country, and, and, and films do make, yeah, faux pas, uh, in Quebec you'd say faux pas, <laughs> right. um, um, that companies do make, because they forget that we, are, we, we have diversity, and sometimes very sharp diversity, within right. countries as well. So I guess you may say that the principles of international management sometimes have to be taken in, into, into account uh, for, for, for domestic management. Uh, but, you know, just this is, this, it's our, our, um, um, our domain of international management is where we, we, we really um, focus on these cultural differences. And also there's, there's other things, of course, different uh, time zones, currencies, um, you know, laws, tax laws, um, exactly. yeah. and that, 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 that you don't uh, generally get in, in within a country. Of course, you have time zone differences in Canada, uh, but, but some of the other issues are, you know, the, uh, shipping issues. Um, so, yeah, they, they, they definitely are the, the lessons from international management that sometimes also have to be taught in regular management. Not to mention the political considerations, uh... Uh, the China with its uh, authoritarian regime, uh, uh, Russia, India with very different uh, po political systems and uh, ways of, of doing business. Right. So yeah, that's, that is also a part of um, um, what we do in international management. Sometimes we use the term international business to talk about the, uh, the country level issues. Um, what is a very hot topic, there are the, uh, the various um, um, alliances of countries that kind of help us through some of these issues. And the classic examples would be, you know, your uh, United Nations and your World Trade Organizations and your, um, um, your um, OECD, uh, which right. Israel is now a me uh, member along with Canada. Um, so, and, and, and of course you have NATO. So, um, and then, you know, that sometimes makes it easy for us to get along within our, um, our little clubs of countries, but then harder to get along with our uh, uh, um, trading partners like China and Russia, who are, uh, who are very different in the way they see the world and, and not so easy to understand uh, um, when it comes to what their uh, objectives are. And they're huge, hugely problematic. Uh, uh, issues when it comes to uh, international business. Interestingly, Israel um, has um, all Israeli businesses that is uh, uh, have been quite successful in in a, in in, um, in their uh, business agree agreements, their trade agreements, their franchising agreements, um, their partnerships with 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 companies from all over the world. That includes China, Russia, Turkey, and. You know, often we, we hear about them later and you just you, right. you sometimes see on your supermarket shelf, you know, cookies that come right. from, you know, goodness right. knows where, Turkey, it's got a kosher, kosher right. strategy. 
the rabbis right. were there. <laughs> um, business, business um, is business. So that's right. Business is business sometimes. Right. Um, um, so yeah, it's extremely interesting to do to deal with these issues. Um, and but sometimes politics does get in the way. You're right. What? Uh, so the second part of your expertise is in uh, professional services. So tell us a little yeah, bit more about so, that. Yeah. So. Um, um, how much time do you have? Um, I, several years ago, I started getting uh, interested in, um, you know, experts and the, ma the management of these organizations like engineering firms, law firms, accounting firms, also in healthcare, where you have so-called professionals working. And because you know, there is a phrase called herding cats which is the difficulty in trying to manage people who are independent experts. Uh, you know, I guess college professors are also in that category and, you know, doctors and lawyers. And you could, you, could, you could say, hey, you know, I don't like your management style where I'm walking out the door. I don't agree with you. Right. So, so that is interested, uh, interested me several years ago. And I started getting interested in the, in the specific managerial issues involved in managing in these professional organizations. And I did a book, um, in the uh, so it came out in '99 uh, on the issue, and sort of was very fortunate um, to team up with a with a, a bunch of researchers uh, from Oxford and from Alberta um, who uh, had centers for the study of professional organizations, and they would invite me over, and we became um, you know like a, a cross university group of researchers studying. You know, the at those stages was remember the big eight, there was a big six and big five. Mm -hmm. uh, these big, these big international firms. Um, and then for many years, I was a fellow of the Oxford Center for the Study of Professional Organizations, and, and they organized conferences. They would, they would ask, ask me to speak often on this issue. And once I was asked to give like a keynote, sort of talking about the whole field and looking at research in this area. And I started looking at research on you know, various professional um, projects, be it you know, accounting firms or law firms or medical settings, and looking at articles written in, in various journals. And I often found that the articles were written in a way that kind of dumbed down the, the contextual issues, i.e. they were talking, let's say, about the human resource issue or the marketing issue or the, the financial issue. And they weren't really giving a lot of uh, details about the fact that this was in an accounting firm or this was in a hospital or that was in a law firm. So I said to some colleagues, this is going back almost 10 years now, well, 2012, <laughs> mm -hmm. very close to 10 years. I said, you know, what we need is a, a journal which brings out these contextual issues, which is interested in how is it different in a law firm to an accounting firm. So to cut a long story short, this meeting happened in Oxford when I was visiting and then literally picked up the phone to Oxford University Press. I can just picture myself doing that and I got a busy signal. I left a message said, hey, Mr. <laughs> so-and-so, you know, I'm you know, Professor Brock and I'm affiliated with this Oxford Center and we want to start this journal. And then within a year or two, the journal actually was started. It's called the Journal of, of Professions and Organization. And it, it, it hit the... the the press in 2014 and so I've been editor-in-chief of that journal since then and that's been very interesting you know being editor of a journal is actually more like running a business than than a scholarly um enterprise right. you know you have to market the thing you have to find right. out who's going to buy it you have What's to find it? professors to write the articles you have to find people to review the articles um, so a lot of the things that I've been teaching now for um, 10 years, I had to actually do You're applying it here. Like a little startup, uh, this, 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 this journal. And, and what, kind of, what kind of distribution, what kind of distribution do you have? Well, that's also very interesting because, uh, the world has changed in almost 10 years. I remember, um, two, you know, just 2013, when we were, we were designing it, you'll, you'll see that we put a lot of effort into the, um, the color and the design and the little the little symbols right. and, and that sort of thing, um, and and the reason we did that is that um, um, a new journal uh, is unknown, 
And so the journal itself, the hard copy becomes like a calling card. At, at academic conferences, you literally hand it, you say, hey, this is the journal, look, see what it, right. and it's going to look attractive, it's going to look cool. Yeah. Um, which is different, if you look at my shelves, you, if I could pull a journal for you, you'll see they're not so fancy and colorful. Right, right. Because those are well-known journals. Everybody Academic. knows what's the yeah. Academy of Management Journal and what's the right. Uh, right. Uh, ASQ, but a new journal has to be attractive. Now, what happened in these 10 years is that everything went online. So uh, after four years of producing the hard copy, um, the world of, of journal publishing changed. Um, to the extent that almost no journals now are, are, are published hard copies anymore. Mm -hmm. It's only old folks like me that have them on my shelves. And, and, and I have these last, you know, the last few that, uh, that were printed about five years ago. So our distribution is now all online through libraries, through, through, um, um, through online uh, subscriptions of various scholars. Um, so we have, you know, you know, we actually have about 10,000 subscribers to our journal, which is, which is a healthy number. And again, remember, it's a small uh, niche. We, we're talking about, um, you know, a, a relatively uh, small specialty, not like, you know, the whole of management or the whole of marketing or the whole of physics. Right. We right. have right. tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world. So we've done very well. And uh, we've done that through, you know, um, um, Two things, uh, and for this I have to I have to tell you a little bit of a story. If I have an, if I have another few minutes, is Go that um, when we started this journal, there, there were three of us that, that, that started the journal. Myself, uh, a colleague called Daniel Musio, and a colleague called uh, Hussein Ludovici, and um, and um, uh, of those, Hussein was the the sort of the senior more. Um, you know, uh, older guy, and what he said, and he, he'd been involved in, in startup journals before, and he said, listen, you have to build a community, and um, so that is what we did, is that we, we stressed the fact that, you know, we were um, uh, research with common interests, we, we, a lot of us are friends, known each other for a long time, we meet occasionally in you know, in Oxford and, and, and Alberta and Boston and, and hopefully soon in Beersheba. Yeah. And um, so we built, we built that community. But the, one of the interesting things is we had, we had the opening ceremony for, for when the journal started. And we were walking, this is in Oxford, we were walking to the, um, to, to the, uh, to the place where the dinner was going to be from, from where the, the panel was going to be. And the, the chair of the, of the Oxford uh, uh, center said to me, David, you know, I just noticed something, you know, you, um, you, Hussein and Daniel, you represent the three major religions of the world. <laughs> um, and so, uh, why don't you, um, at, at this dinner, you know, each sort of give a kind of a blessing for uh, <laughs> over the meal or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, Daniel said, Daniel kind of, who's obviously, <laughs> representing Christianity, he said something, I think he ended up saying it in Latin, and Hussein said something in Arabic, and I said something in Hebrew. So Fantastic. yeah, so this was, I think, our our secret source for, for this journal is, is this community feel around the world, all the different all the different players. Um, and but it's been very interesting, again, going back to cross-cultural issues, but then united in our interest in this thing that we call professional organization and the world of professionals and and in today's world of expert workers so let's just so that's a great that's a great story but so let's just finish on your on your personal journey in terms of uh south africa new zealand united states uh and then and uh, making aliyah the deciding to live <laughs> in israel settling in beersheba in the negev in 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 the you know reader's digest version Give us the uh, how how that journey came about. Uh, the Reader's Digest version has to be a very very small uh, bit of what happened, but I'll tell you two little stories uh, that kind of uh, um, it's well one is right at the beginning of the journey, which was like twenty five years ago, where I when I met my wife, and at that stage I was living in New Zealand and she was living in Tel Aviv. And one of our very first dates, I said to her, you know, would you consider, you know 
coming to live with me in New Zealand, which is not exactly around the corner. And she said to me, okay, as long as in the long run, we can bring about kids in Israel. And I said to her, kids? <laughs> kids <laughs> <It's a name. laughs> uh, so turns out, it's okay, this is a very short, but thank God in the 25 years we had, I have kids <laughs> and we bring them up in Israel. So that's the beginning of it. I'll tell you another story uh, toward, well, actually no, this, this, this happened five years later. I made a Leah. And of course, we moved to Ranana, um, you know, where, 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 where uh, the Americans and Africans live. And I went on the job market looking for a job. And this was 2001, 2002, second intifada, economic recession, budgetary problem. Pro you know, you went, I went around to all the, all the, the universities in Israel. Um, and I won't mention the names of these universities, but the first one in the sort of middle of the country, the dean said to me, you know, David, we really love, we really like you. We really, we really want you, but we don't have the budget for it. And then the next guy said to me, David, we really like you. We really need you, but we don't have the budget. And eventually I came, I heard there was a university in, in the Negev. Um, and I came to the dean here and he said, yeah, David, we really like you. We really need you. We don't have the budget, but you know what? We're going to make it happen. There and you go. so that was the difference. That was the difference. And that's how I ended up here. And that, that, I guess, summarizes you know, what makes this university great, that yeah. the dean said he'll make it happen. And I do make it happen here at, at BGU. So it's been a you know, life changing for me, for my wife and for these children who appeared from New Zealand that came with us and joined us. My daughter's now a student here as well. My son's in the army. So uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a life changing experience wow. and it's a wonderful institution. And you know, people like you that make it happen and, and your great community up in, in Canada uh, that supports us and is interested and comes to visit. Hopefully you guys will come to visit soon. And, and that's what makes, it, makes this a great place and, and, and a fabulous institution. Thank you to you guys. Well, well thank you. I, I think you summed it up. You know, the, that be, we're, we're so impressed and the, all of us professionals and volunteers that BGU can do. Yes, it's hard, yes, but we'll make it happen. If it's important enough, we'll make it happen. And that's the way we also work. So David, thank you very much. And uh, Galit, it's to, to close it up. Thanks, Simon, and thank you both for a fascinating chat once again. And David, I have to say, uh, you're speaking my language when you talk about branding uh, with that journal that you mentioned. To our viewers, we hope that you enjoyed our coffee date today. If you would like to learn more about the work and the research that's being conducted at BGU, please be sure to visit our website. You can find us at www.bengurion.ca. And while you're on our website, you'll be prompted to sign up for our newsletter. Go ahead and do that. You can also follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Coffee with our researchers. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.